Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Let us now discuss uh, the players of Mahesh Al Kanchwar. But before we move to the first play of under discussion, which would be called, uh, which is called Garbo, let us let me give you an introduction to the playwright's uh, life and uh, some of his uh, major engagements with theatre. Mahesh Al Kanchwar, born in 1939, belonged to a generation of playwrights who satirized the corruption and estrangement of urban life. But what distinguished El Kanchwar from the others was the fact that his critique of urban life was from the perspective of a small town immigrant. He was born in a Telugu Brahmin family that had migrated to Vidarbha district in Maharashtra. He completed his matriculation, undergraduate and postgraduate studies in Nagpur University, and it was in Nagpur that he was first exposed to Marathi theatre, which led him to then pen several plays. He taught English literature in a college in Nagpur, but he wrote his plays in Marathi. And Vijay Tendulkar is said to have had an impact on his work. He experimented with a variety of forms from expressionist to absurdist theatre. He also wrote several essays that elaborated his opinions on theatre. In an essay uh, called Notes on Theatre, which has been translated uh, and uh, which, is, which is a part of uh, his, the translation of his collected plays uh, published by Oxford University Press, El Kanchwar lays out his perspective of theatre and what he believes is the form and function of theatre. He emphasizes the importance of experience, indeed the very experience of life in theatre. The experience of theatre is impeded, he says, when playwrights place exclusive importance on meaning. El Kanchwar uh, criticizes playwrights who predetermine the meaning of the play through their excessive use of words that make meaning explicit and unidimensional. Free space within the text becomes important in this regard. So in his own words, Mahesh El Kanchwar says that this space this free space within the text is filled by multiple possibilities of experience that an actor has to embody and realize through his acting. El Kanchwar then recounts his very bitter experience with his friends and peers who did not understand his theatre that they thought was too bourgeois and middle class in the way it was about the private realm or the private pain of the individual. He wonders if the individual has, as El Kanchwar has to, wonders if the individual has to be pitted against or subordinated to the socio-political concerns of society at large. Right? Does there have to be a hierarchy of theatres, one which is more invested in the social and economic concerns of society at large, and uh, the other which is about the privations of the individual? Uh, does there have to be a hierarchy of theatres? He wonders if art and ideology have to be incompatible. And he doesn't consider himself as someone who has used theatre for ideological purposes. He, he, he probably identifies himself more as someone who is more invested in the artistic form of the play uh, without uh, explicitly uh, engaging in any kind of ideological propaganda. But he sees uh, Kanhaila. Uh, the, uh, the the very important, uh, significant uh, Manipuri uh, theatre practitioner, Kanai Lal's theatre as a perfect blend of ideology and art. He wonders if art and ideology have to be seen as polar opposites in uh, theatre. Is there a way in which you know ideology does not completely supersede or uh, suppress uh, art, the, the artistic form of the play, right? Uh, so it's important to not ignore 
the artistic form of the play uh, when it comes to using or uh, theatre as a, as a form of, as a codified uh, form of political language. Right? So, for, so, for example, he says that emotion has become taboo. To express emotion uh, become, has, has become taboo unless it gets the sanctity and legitimacy uh, of the cause that this particular form of political theatre is championing. Right. So, so is, does everything have to be legitimized, everything have to be instrumentalized uh, to cater to uh, a political purpose? So uh, he tries to uh, dismiss and challenge these charges of elitism uh, that uh, come with the uh, rather kind of familiar debate now between uh, art for art's sake and art for uh, society's sake, right? Uh, so, you know, is uh, art for art's sake uh, completely div divorced from any kind of ideology, any kind of uh, political purpose, even if it is not explicit? Uh, is it is it uh, a socially irresponsible, morally irresponsible form of theatre? Or uh, is it possible to actually completely blur or do away with this hierarchy between art for others' sake and art for, or art for society's sake and art for art's sake? And uh, think of, uh, you know, uh, marrying the two in some sense, uh, you know, in, in, in trying to think about, uh, you know, a new uh, artistic form of theatre which is not compromised by or separable from the political message, if any, that it is trying to uh, communicate and convey. So he's he's very clear in the intentions uh, with which he writes theatre. So he says in, in the in the same essay, uh, notes on uh, Indian on theatre. He says that when I write, I expect a personal response from my reader or viewer and not a conditioned reflex which is always a result of the preconceived codification of life. Although I have felt close to certain ideologies at various stages in my life, I have always been convinced that no ideology is greater than life itself. If I am not using theatre as a weapon, if it is a means of self-expression for me, my writing will concern itself with life as I experience it and not with doctrine. As Ionesco says, any work of art which is ideological and nothing less would be pointless, tautological, inferior to the doctrine it claims to demonstrate. An honest reader, writer prides from a, from, the, from a very private core of his being, which is beyond the control of intellect and so, and so a major part of his perception is often subjective. It is to this that the reader or viewer has to respond in the same spirit. So the emphasis here is on the subjective experience of writing and performing theatre, which is really about the experience of, of life itself and not about any particular doctrine. Because to then substitute one doctrine for another, to think of also art, the art of theatre as a doctrine is also to then uh, engage in a very self-defeating exercise where you just try and substitute, uh, if not politics, some kind of political propaganda or ideology with art, right? as though art were in itself a doctrine or, or an ideology. He says later on in the same essay, no ideology can liberate us from the pain of living and fear of death or our thirst for the absolute. Art tries to transcend tangible reality and aspires to journey into an unnameable, indefinable reality that is constantly pulsating between the to beneath the topical. It cannot limit itself only to concrete ideological thinking. When a writer writes, he writes about the subjective man who is the epicenter of his experience. That is why an individual's private pain is as important as the pain of a mass of humanity and can also be easily shared as a universal experience. Right? So he is trying to also blur the very distinction between individual pain and uh, collective pain because individual pain can also be uh, easily shared as a universal experience. And later on, he also goes on to talk about the importance of the poetic, of how the po how, how important the poetic is in theatre. And of course, again, thinking of the poetry as an experience, as a sublime experience of, of literary language, and uh, not necessarily explicitly poetry as such, but yes. Uh, you know, a use of literary language which does not involve too many words, but is also, you know, uh, amenable to uh, the experience of acting, of embodying the, uh, of embodying language, uh, you know, in, with with minimal minimal words, with minimal verbosity, uh, in terms of trying to uh, execute space uh, uh, through the actor's body. So this is his 
thoughts on Indian theatre. So coming to the first play uh, that we will discuss by El Mahesh El Kanchwar, which, is, which, which belongs to the early phase of his, uh, of his uh, career as a playwright, it's called Garbo. Garbo is an early play by Mahesh El Kanchwar that instantiates his engagement with the significance of life itself. It portrays three young men from Nagpur uh, who are isolated and bored with urban life in Mumbai. Srimanth is a wealthy businessman. Pansy, a young self-indulgent adolescent who has left his parents. And Intuk, a professor who pontificates on the meaning of art and life. Garbo is a petty film actress in B-grade movies who is also constructed as an aesthetic ideal for the men trapped in their sitting room. For the men, Garbo is a challenge. For Pansy, I mean for the men, Garbo is a challenge. Uh, uh, for Pansy, a mother figure. Uh, and for Intuk, an inexhaustible aesthetic ideal. They all use her for their own desire to transcend themselves, but their private images of Garbo are often in undermined by Gar Garbo's bitter comebacks and self-contempt. When they suddenly discover she is pregnant, it fills each man with a new sense of purpose and salvation that, that, that would free them from their petty and insular worlds, although they do not wish to embrace the responsibilities that would come with it, and each hopes that they are the father, that he is the father of the child who will inherit their names. So let's look at the play itself. This is just a brief overview of the play. Uh, you have a fairly simple uh, setting, which is, uh, you know, uh, a sitting room furnished in a casually luxurious style. Uh, there's an intellectual intook, the professor who's relaxing, puffing on a cigarette, while Pansy, the, uh, the, um, uh, the adolescent, uh, is uh, twiddling the knobs of a radio. And you can make out that there's a sense of, uh, of tedium, there's a mode that's created of tedium and boredom, uh, of, and these men don't know how to spend time, what to do with, it, with themselves in, uh, in uh, Bombay. So Pansy tells Intuk, uh, do you know what I used to do back home? There's no radio there. So I'd go and stand in front of the pawn shop or the cafe, or barge straight into the barbers, listen to the songs for a while and then beat it, pretending there's too much of a rush. Of course, in those days, it was only Hindi songs for me. But English songs are the greatest. I'd never heard them before I came here, and now it's nothing but. Intuk, I don't seem to enjoy even classical music these days. Do you know, Pansy, in the old days, just a single tan fluttering somewhere on a distant breeze was enough to give me goose flesh. And of course, listening to the real thing would bring me to tears and all. Strange, bloody experience. Then later on, um, Intuk says. Now, Intuk is a professor who's constantly commenting on the artifice, the fakeness of people in the city, of how he notices, for example, people who throng uh, elite folks, who throng the performance uh, spaces of the city uh, and pretend to understand and appreciate uh, Hindustani music. Right? So when he goes to, stuffy, to what Pansy calls the stuffy concerts, Intuk says that you should see the crowds that come there. God knows where the bastards buy all their enthusiasm. The vocalist, male or female, sits under the arch of two Tanpuras like some deity. They go crazy about their own marvelous voices, belching out with sublime ardor at all those sublime idiots sitting out front with their overdressed, simpering idiot wives. That's why I clap the longest and the loudest at the end of every song. Alone, of course, and with this terrific, solemn face, and people think this chap's a great lover of music. It's a real laugh. So obviously he's himself trying to pretend to be a great connoisseur of Hindustani music while he's actually sitting there observing the pretense, the pretentiousness of these other uh, people who have come to watch the concert. And later on Intuk says, after all, I'm a professor. I'm supposed to understand everything. Crap, once you get yourself stamped professor, you can literally run amok. I'll tell you about people. Once I was clapping the skin off my hands when a baldy next to me says, Wonderful Kaushi Kanra, isn't it? Wasn't it? I made my face even more dreadfully solemn and said, It wasn't Kaushi Kanra. It was Nayaki Kanra. So the chap turns to his dolled up wife and says, Terrific Nayaki Kanra, isn't it? That's the way it is. So obviously he realizes that they're all pretending. They don't know anything at all. Those days are gone, kiddo, Intuk tells Pansy again, when you could enjoy music as a private pleasure. Nowadays, these musical conferences are an immense fraud perpetrated by the community upon the community. 
Every, everybody from the singers down to the listeners are under religious obligation to pretend to be intensely interested in art. They sing Mishra ragas, Sale, Bachchu, try to sing simple, straightforward ragas first. But people are only too keen to outclap them. What more do you want, kid? You've got everything there except good music. You should come with me sometime. So this is his uh, comment on the pretentiousness of uh, the uh, uh, people in Mumbai who come to listen to Hindustani concerts. There's a deep sense of boredom and disillusionment with the uh, pretense and artifice of urban life. We also learn later on that both these people, Intuk and Pansy, are living with Srimanth, who is a wealthy uh, businessman in Bombay. If Intuk is the professor who wants to constantly pontificate on the meaning of life, uh, Pansy is a, a very uh, restless and insecure uh, adolescent who was rescued by uh, Intuk and Srimanth from uh, committing suicide at a railway station by jumping in front of the train. So he's, he abandons his parents, he can't live with them anymore. He comes in search of his own fortunes but loses hope. He's on the verge of committing suicide when he's rescued by uh, Intuk and uh, Srimanth. So he's just 17. But Pansy already seems to be terribly bored of his life. And Intuk says, Pansy, 17 years old and bored, observe this youth, bored at 17. What will you be when you get to my age? So uh, the play very intentionally has characters who belong to different age groups. One is young, one who's adolescent, one who's probably middle-aged, and one who's slightly older, Srimanth and Intuk. And this is to show how people of different ages are uh, equally disillusioned and bored by life in the city. Uh, so there's a, a deep sense of existentialist unease uh, and, uh, and isolation in uh, the city. And Intuk himself uh, reveals the fact that he is an, he's a poet. He writes poems, but he realizes that he is, he is lacking originality. He, uh, perhaps his, po his poems may have won him you know, instant fame, but then uh, he realizes he only knows that his poetry is not original, right? that he is not able to produce anything uh, original. He, is, he feels he is creatively, he is, he is uh, stunted. Uh, as, as, a, as a poet. Right? His, his creative abilities are stunted. So he says, and this talk of, utter, of talk of fame is utter crap. People are fools. They call you great, but you feel that way from within, idiot. Think carefully before you answer. Pat came the reply, you are not great. Then what is all this about? These stories and poems. They are a hoax, came the second answer. What, why are you doing it? To become famous. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to become famous, but what exactly is fame? What does it mean? What are you when you're famous? Fame is a sort of pleasant allegation foisted upon your name. And that's when you put a stop to writing and all that sort of nonsense. Forget about the whole thing and wallow happily in boredom. But is that the end? Certainly not. People are worse frauds than you think. They start singing another tune. Here's a writer who knows when to stop his single-minded devotion to art, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, he is trapped between uh, pro probably, uh, you know, having fame foisted, thrust upon him because of his, uh, his uh, stories and poems. But on the other hand, he realizes that he does not feel creative, he does not feel original from within. So the world may appreciate you as a creative writer, but if you don't feel that sense of creativity, it makes no difference. And so he also seems to be then trapped within this fake sense of, this apparent sense of being a creative and famous uh, poet and writer, and on the other hand, uh, feeling utterly bored with himself and his own life, and this, this complete lack of meaning in life. And so uh, what do you have if, if, if it's not this, this fakeness, this fake, popularity, this fake fame which is foisted upon you, you have a deep sense of boredom and ennui with life itself. Pansy is bored, just like Intuk is bored and he realizes that he is not an original writer. So he feels bored and you have Srimanth who enters, who is again an equally effete and failed man. Right? He's a businessman He and there, there, there are also plays, there are, there are also performances being performed within this play where these three men uh, play other characters or they play each other, but all these performances within the play are meant to again stage that say, enact that and dramatize the same sense of, uh, of disillusionment and failure. Srimanth in the first performance within the play uh, performs a policeman who is uh, charging these uh, two people, Intuk and Pansy, with, uh, with uh, mouthing obscenities. Right. 
So you're, he says you're guilty of using impossibly clean language, shown of all obscenity. In fact, just the opposite. The first charge is using absolutely pure, chaste language which has no obscenities in it, thus causing acute embarrassment to those who are in the habit of using abusive language. Charge number two, you're both guilty of expressing contempt and disgust towards drinking, meat eating, smoking, opium, hemp and LSD. Number three, instead of having a bit of fun with good looking chicks, and letting them go, you softly indulge in pure and sublime love. And in your attempts to remain celibate, you either soil your underwear at nights, against which habit the entire race of dhobis is soon going to launch a protest in the form of a demonstration, or and you lock yourself in the toilet at odd hours of the day and night, causing great inconvenience to others. Right. So this is of course a dramatization of the kinds of moral and social values that society holds on to. That society is always uh, torn between values of let's say teetotalism, of celibacy, of uh, sexual morality right? and of uh, using a pure elite language which is shown of all obscenities and uh, the unconscious desires that constantly operate within society, within people's minds, uh, the kinds of desires they need, they have for pleasure, for sexual pleasure, for pleasure that comes from the uh, consumption of drugs and uh, drinking and meat eating and so on. And Srimad himself is incapable of using, of speaking in fluent English. So he makes constant English um, mistakes in his English, uh, grammatical errors for which Intuk has to step out of his role and play the professor, constantly checking, checking and correcting his English. And of course, Intuk perhaps also stands in for Mahesh Al Kanchwar because in the play, he is a leading literator of Maharashtra. He is a Maharashtrian literary figure who teaches English and who also knows English. And of course, Sriman pretending to be the police officer says, I am a police officer, which is why my English has to be bad. Right? So he's again, again making a comment on class uh, differences between the anglicized uh, reading and speaking public as opposed to the professional classes, the working classes, the police. Right. So this is a performance within the play which uh, dramatizes the hypocrisy of social norms and uh, social differences of class. And then of course Srimant uh, pronounces the court's judgment, the court's verdict. Taking into consideration the serious nature of your crimes, the court has decided that all that gold medals shall be hung around your necks for each of the following charges. Integrity, extensive scholarship, ardent selflessness, boundless philanthropy, humble service, burning patriotism and unblemished character. Accused will, will then be made to sit in a cushy flower bedecked impala and driven all around the town to the accompaniment of a brass band. All at every square, pious Suhagans, uh, young, you know, married brides, uh, wives, wearing traditional pearl nose ornaments will give them a hero's reception. Right? So, again, you see, note the sarcasm of this that they're all people who embody the very ideals of society, uh, of nationalism, right? and they're going to be honored for that very service. So this performance uh, kind of falls into some kind of ridicule and fun and of course then they are again left as lifeless and bored as they were before the performance. Right? So they are terribly bored, the liquor shops are opened, are, are shut on a Sunday, they don't know what to do with their time, they are all thinking of Garbo. The conversations between Intuk, Sriman and Pansy also in some sense echo Mahesh Kalkanchwa's own conversations and debates on theatre with uh, his interlocutors, his peers. Uh, so ag again, there's a discussion between the three men in the play on uh, why, for example, sentimentality or emotions are being ridiculed. Uh, you know, why why are sentimentalists uh, out of fashion? Right? Why is sentimentality being ridiculed? Uh, why is emotion taboo? And of course, there is a, there is a, Intuk, for example, is one of those uh, intellectuals who is uh, against any kind of ex expression of emotion on stage. So he says, ten years ago, the sentimentalists were a fashion stuffing their handkerchiefs and their saris ends, sari ends in their mouth and sobbing their bloody hearts out. On the stage, one female will ask another female for pickles or some such nonsense and out there in the auditorium, the entire lot of fancily dressed females would collapse in spasms of grief. What a laugh, right? So there's a comment on the changing tastes of among theatre audiences and uh, directors of what they actually want to see on stage. It's no longer one of uh, emotion, of, of heightened emotion on stage, but it's more uh, an attempt to try and purge the theatre of emotion, of sentimentality, of excessive uh, display of emotions. And there's a talk of, of Garbo, of how Pansy feels Garbo is a very rational woman. 
as someone who never seems to lose lose her emotional balance and if you remember now garbo is a b grade actress she's somebody who performs someone else she lives in a world of make believe right and so again you see actors who are playing something else in the play right so they're all, they're constantly trying to uh, play themselves but they're also playing someone else right so you have actors playing actors playing characters in this case in the play right so you're twice or thrice removed from any sense of reality of what these actors may be as real human beings the whole question of of the self of who what is who is the authentic self who what is the truth of the self remains a question in the play which is unanswered to the very end so shrimanth constantly describes pansy as someone who is a sex machine right he says he tells pansy that uh in what way is garbo great even though pansy thinks uh, of uh, garbo as a mother as an exalted figure as someone who is noble and great uh shriman questions her greatness she say, he says her only business in life has been jumping from bed to bed she's nothing but a sex machine a sex machine yes a sex machine and that's that's what he calls her that he she is someone who is who's poly uh, promiscuous having multiple affairs with many men and also uh, you know acting someone else playing chaste women so the, the irony the hypocrisy in garbo's life is between let's say her the the roles she plays of chaste hindu wives and women on stage or in film sorry uh, but at the same time uh, having illicit affairs uh, with many men intuk says hold on shriman you have made two sta- statements in the last few seconds which are diametrically opposed to each other completely contradictory first you said garbo is great in bed then you said she's a sex machine now if she's a machine she's devoid of emotions and if she's devoid of emotions she can't be great in bed right so you see how garbo in some sense also embodies the very idea of theater of what the function of theater is is theater supposed to actually exude uh, display uh, emotions on stage or is it supposed to be devoid of emotions right um uh, similarly garbo is garbo someone who is if she's a sex machine then she is by definition not someone who can uh, uh display emotions on stage she is uh, purely mechanical in her actions right Uh, or is she someone who uh, and therefore she cannot be great in bed if uh, according to intuk somebody who is incapable of feeling cannot be good in bed but if she is devoid of emotions she can't be great in bed so shrimant is someone who is seems to be completely against any kind of emotion she he doesn't associate uh, love making or uh, the sexual act with any kind of intimacy uh, but for intuk garbo is this inexhaustible aesthetic ideal it's not like as the garbo is in love with uh, it's not as though intuk is in love with the real garbo we don't know who or what the real garbo is but she is projected as an aesthetic ideal for intuk so uh, intuk wants to intellectualize the garbo as an as an aesthetic ideal who is inexhaustible no matter how much or how far you get to know her you sleep with her uh, you make love to her you will never actually be able to exhaust uh, uh, the real uh, garbo the garbo that we know shriman asks uh, intuk do you think that uh, uh, garbo is uh, someone sacred and sublime uh because they are all sexually involved in garbo right they're all physically involved with her so uh he doesn't understand words like sacred and sublime right what does it mean to be sacred what does it mean to be sublime intuk says well does it really make any difference whether we call garbo this or that names don't change things garbo will remain garbo while we will continue to search for the kind of garbo we want if we find her well and good if we don't we will suffer a bit or not or not even that after a while so it's all about names how do we make meaning out of life by naming things the, through the act of naming through the act of nomination of nomenclature hmm? so does if the name is a signifier do signifiers signify something do they connote something and does that make a difference to the way we perceive reality hmm? how does language mediate or condition our perception of reality garbo will remain garbo I mean, we're actually not even talking about the real Garbo, but what does Garbo represent? What does Garbo stand in for us? Is she just uh, an outlet for uh, sexual desire, uh, a form of, uh, of of trying to vent uh, one's own frustration with uh, with uh, the alienation of urban life through uh, the sexual act, or is she an aesthetic ideal uh, that uh, remains inexhaustible and 
ever is and, and ever receding right she cannot actually be um, uh, you know so maybe perhaps she is also as al kanchwar himself says perhaps a medium for uh, intuk's own art uh, the art of writing uh, the art of producing poetry and and stories uh, I, i mean do we need garbo uh, something like an ideal to actually enable us to uh, transcend our own limited selves in order to reach the unlimited the absolute the transcendental in life in took says then why do we try to define her or any woman or anything in the world for that matter i think we should we should just lay back let garbo be what she is the important thing is to know what we are if we do that becomes a sound enough basis for our relationships with her later on um shriman asks uh, you know um uh intuk does a, a woman like garbo ever become stale no matter how many times you sleep with garbo does she ever go stale and intuk says don't they sleep with a woman twice and you know her inside out intuk says don't make foolish witticisms please all this business about woman being an enigma and all that is myth a bit of literary stupidity to tell you the truth once you've understood a woman you don't want to look at her again once you've explored her the thrill is gone woman should be able to satisfy you fully and yet withhold a part of herself from you right so even though uh, intuk seems to dismiss many literary representations of woman as a, an in- inexhaustible ideal he seems to in some sense also uh, echo and uh, duplicate that same uh, what he calls the same literary nonsense about representing a woman as someone who always withholds a part of herself even as she is able to satisfy a man completely so intuk says to put it in a nutshell garbo never becomes common even after fulfilling the needs of all three of us a part of her still remains untouched so you so in so garbo is constantly oscillating between a woman who is a, an actual woman a real woman who uh, is a big red actress who sleeps around with many men with film film producers with actors directors cameramen um but at the same time is also being salvaged as a uh, an ideal symbol of the in aspirations of these men to uh, in uh, to overcome their own limited uh, lives their limited selves in uh, the city of bombay we also see the kinds of percept the perception the way garbo is perceived by these three men uh, pansy of course uh, you know puts her puts garbo on a pedestal as somebody who is an uh, you know a completely exalted figure mother figure sister figure uh, for shrimant uh, she is just a petty actress who sleeps around and someone who can help him overcome his own uh, failed masculinity we realize towards the end of the play that shrimant is actually uh, impotent and emasculated and uh, is also secretly possesses desires pansy Uh, and wants pansy for his own in order to validate uh, validate his own uh, failed masculinity and garbo herself is someone who's trying to you know uh, humor these men she she cannot put up with all the accusations she she tries to always she she is she is contemptuous of herself of her own life as as a bigred actress as somebody who's promiscuous but at the same time she's also trying to str- she struggles to actually resist the charges against her by these men uh, so she's either she's wedged between uh, being a loose actress a woman who sleeps around a promiscuous woman and someone who is an aesthetic ideal an artistic ideal who is again fixed and frozen and uh, and whose uh, uh, role apparently is to uh, inspire these men to create uh, to write to to rise above their limited selves and then they also have another play performance within the performance after garbo enters uh, where uh, garbo is pretending to be the daughter of intuk Pansy and Shrimant play each other, and Garbo is pretending to be daughter of a very uh, pious man, uh, a woman who loses her chastity, her virginity to uh, another man, and ends up uh, bearing his Ill- illicit uh, child. And uh, to, by the end of the play, uh, the performance within the play, she's forced to uh, kill the child. Uh, she's forced to uh, commit infanticide. and uh, kill the illegitimate child uh, because uh, she never had uh, you know any chastity in the first place right so she is not a pure chaste woman uh, the daughter of uh, a respectable family uh, but uh, has lost all her reputation because of this illegitimate child that she has then she then has to uh, kill and murder so they are trying to imagine the reaction that their respectable neighbor tatya who tatya is this uh, very pious and uh, orthodox uh, maharashtrian neighbor of uh, shrimans and they imagine uh, what uh, how he would react if they if he, if he overheard their conversations
So again, you see the, how the performances within the play again project women as someone who's trapped between these two binaries, uh, these two oppositions between chaste uh, wife, mother figure, and the uh, uh, loose whore. Right. So this is constant uh, oscillation between the two, and Garbo is unable to actually find a way out of this binary. Then uh, they also discover that uh, Garbo is pregnant, right? And uh, uh, each man, uh, you know, sees uh, his collective, uh, his uh, his salvation in the child. Each man uh, hopes that uh, they that he is the father of the child. Right? So they that's why they actually need. Uh, 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 Garbo because they are envious of the fact that she can produce a child, that she can procreate and they themselves wish that they could procreate but they can't. But uh, they use the wom woman in this case as a medium through which they can pass on their own name. Right? So the, w the function of the woman as someone who transmits patrimony from father to son. So the, the possibility of becoming a father to uh, Garbo's child fills uh, the men's lives with a sense of a new sense of purpose. and. It's in this performance of pretense when they actually begin to play each other that they, uh, in, as Intuk says, to be somebody else is a way of feeling alive for a little while at least. So they all want to pretend and be someone else because they don't know how to be themselves. What does it mean to be yourself? What does it mean to be true to yourself? Right? Uh, so what does it mean to be authentic? Right? And in fact, perhaps Garbo is the one who's trying to be the most authentic of these four characters because she realizes that she is, she acknowledges the fact that she's leading an inauthentic life as an actress. She's always pretending to be someone else. She is always trying to pretend and pass off and masquerade, right? And in fact, that's, what, that's exactly what she does in the play because she's also trying to masquerade as, uh, as a mother, right? In fact, uh, we realize later on that she doesn't have a child. She willingly uh, aborted the child during a shoot uh, when she was acting in a movie. Uh, she uh, has an abortion. Uh, but um, uh, initially she pretends as though she's bearing uh, the child of these three men and she gives them the men a fake sense of of reassurance of uh, of hope so it becomes clear from these uh, these conversations that the only way that uh, a woman can be uh, can can enjoy instant morality is by being absolutely insensate right she cannot have any desires of her own she she has she's purely uh, a puppet in the hands of men and she only reflects the uh, power of men right the masculinity of men so she is uh, her father's daughter and then she is a man's wife so she never seems to have any sense of self ownership and she's transmitted or exchanged between men uh, so that's the only way that she can be uh, uh, secure from the charge from any, any charges of social uh, stigma uh, but uh, so she has no freedom of her own and that's exactly what is being presented in these performances within the play where for example she she plays the daughter of a pious man and uh, she is uh, uh, being charged by Tatya the pious neighbor f uh, for being uh, an absolutely uh, uh, disreputable woman who has uh, seduced another man and, and then uh, had his child his illegitimate child so uh, she has to uh, commit infanticide in a play but, uh, you know, they uh, also realize that uh, the, the, the three men in the play, that uh, they have no escape. And there's no escape out of the filth uh, that, that they live in, right? The, the filth, of course, here refers to the uh, effete, uh, unproductive, uh, you know, death in life existence that they lead, that they lead right? He says that uh, when, when, the, when Garbo, who plays the girl within, in the performance within the play, is forced to uh, commit infanticide, there's nothing left to look forward to, right, once a child is dead. Uh, you feel revolted, Intuk says, you, f you think we are wallowing in filth. Fair enough. Can you show me a single place that is clean? Show me. There's nothing left. If we, are follow if we are wallowing in filth, there's no escape for us. We must continue to live in the same filth. And we will say this filth is beautiful. In order to render this filth endurable, we will have to make up new theories about beauty. A sort of aesthetics of filth and depravity. Right? So they feel that they cannot help the fact that they are completely subject to their own sexual desires, uncontrollable as it is, their own desire for their own greed for pleasure. But that, that greed for pleasure right, uh, is only an un unsuccessful attempt to escape from their own degenerate, depraved lives. They don't see any way out of it. And then they're all arguing about, they're all wondering whether, uh, wondering about who the child belongs to, who is the father of the child. And uh, 
And Garbo says, so you have talked the whole thing over, have you? The minute I become pregnant, I also become cheap. We'll allow ourselves to forget those days when you followed me around like dogs and couldn't do without me. Look here, I haven't come here to throw myself on your mercy. I don't want any help from you. I came here simply because I was feeling restless and uneasy. But today I've seen you in your true color. Remember one thing though, I could implicate all three of you in this if I wanted to. So don't think you can shrug off responsibility. So they don't want to take responsibility for the child, but the whole question of paternity is also a puzzle. Right? We don't know who the father of the child is. Right? Each one thinks that maybe hopes that he is the father of the child, but n none of the men want to take responsibility for the child. So let us just continue with uh, our discussion of uh, Garbo. So you noticed in the uh, uh, that I was talking about how these three men in the play uh, are not interested in taking responsibility for uh, the child that uh, Garbo is apparently carrying. And they don't know at that point in the end of the first act that Garbo has uh, aborted the child, right? So they don't want to take responsibility for the children, for the child, but uh, they still want to have uh, enjoy the privilege of uh, uh, transmitting their their name as the father uh, through the child, and they they believe that uh, Garbo is their only source of hope, of uh, novelty, of creating something new from their life of filth. And uh, they're all desperate to actually uh, father, be the father of the child and, and, and for Garbo to actually uh, carry the child to term, but they don't realize that she has aborted the child. And so at, uh, at the end of the first act, there is um, uh, the three men imploring Pansy, uh, impo imploring Garbo to, uh, to have the child. And uh, the Intuk says, for example, uh, we will all humble ourselves before him, of course, assuming that, this, that the child uh, is a boy. He'll be our creation and we will bow our heads before our own creation. Right? So you see the kind of uh, the, the narcissism of these men who, uh, who want to um, uh, create something, uh, create a child through Garbo. And um, he says later, a single smile from him will move us. Uh, Garbo, let us do this. We are doomed people. Uh, we have neither seen nor experienced nor created, created anything beyond filth. So this is the one opportunity they have, they believe, to create something which is authentic, something which is original, something which will redeem their life of filth. Let us grab this opportunity. It's our only hope, our only chance. We will create something beautiful out of this filth. The world will know that there is a life somewhere which is beautiful, pure, fearless, innocent. And Garbo, we cannot achieve this without you. Do you know? Do you know what a tremendous role you have to play? And then Garbo says, here, don't go, don't you go loading me with new responsibilities. And then Garbo says, of course I do. I do feel the immensity of this thing. It's very beautiful and all that, to be a mother of a beautiful thing. But do we have the guts to see the whole thing through? Suppose we suddenly get cold feet. And there are all the other difficulties. If we decide on this, I'll lose nearly a year and all my contracts will have to be cancelled one after the other and so on and so forth. So she's more concerned about her career as an actor. What if she loses uh, all her contracts that she's signed with uh, film directors? What if she loses her job over her child? And, and at this point, she still hasn't reve revealed that the, the fact that she has, uh, she has uh, aborted the child. And um, so, yeah, so Garbo is the one who constantly reminds them of the hypocrisy of uh, motherhood and fatherhood, institutions like motherhood and fatherhood in the family, right? And she is quite happy being a woman who flits from one man to another. And uh, she also reminds the men that, uh, that, that they are just illusioning, that, that, that they're only holding on to their own illusions. Uh, if they think that uh, this child is going to redeem their life, then they're obviously uh, deluding themselves. They're, they're actually uh, convinced, they're actually determined to lead a life of, um, of illusions. Uh, and every man seems to hang on to these illusions of self-ownership, of masculinity, of um, you know, uh, security uh, to actually enable uh, themselves to lead a very uh, secure life. And so towards the end, the three men actually uh, you know, perform a, uh, a small little uh, dance which, which uh, basically uh, reinstates their hope uh, uh, of uh, collective salvation uh, through the child. So Intuk tells Garbo that a new life is beckoning you, don't reject it. It's our only chance. Garbo, this is our only refuge, our only chance to create something beautiful. You are life itself. We will do anything for you. You only have to say the word. 
we'll do it. Okay, and then towards the end of the first act, Srimanth, Intuk and Pansy together say, You are life and the root of all life, the spring of fearless beauty, the source of all hope, the fulfillment of all promises are you. You are the beginning of belief, you are the everlasting, all future suns are in your womb. Give us your light, give us your sun. He will burn up darkness and destroy it. Retribution in the face of injustice, compassion in the face of suffering, sympathy in the face of calamity, courage in the face of death. This he will be, he will be creation out of destruction. Mother, mother, mother. So this of course is a play that in some sense is also attacking the patriarchal construction of women as um, either divine mother who reproduces, who procreates, who is the source of all creation, the source of all redemption and hope. And on the other hand also someone who is woman as, as uh, uh, you know, as whore, as loose whore, as somebody who uh, moves on from man to man and makes every man feel uh, terribly insecure because they are unable to actually possess the woman, right? So this is constant binary between the two. And the woman is trapped between these two constructions of womanhood. Uh, in Act 2, again, you see uh, an elaboration of uh, these male uh, sense of desperation, the way they hold on to Garbo as their only source of hope and uh, redemption. Uh, and then uh, towards the uh, later on in the second act is where uh, Garbo reveals the fact that she aborts the child during a shoot uh, at the setting and uh, the, the men are completely disillusioned again that they have now have absolutely no hope to actually redeem their own lives. There's no way out of the filth and that they actually go back to living uh, extremely meaningless uh, and, uh, you know, sterile lives. And then, um, yeah, so here Garbo, for example, on page 48 of Act 2, she says, Oh dear, how he worries. There were many people with me. This is when she describes the, the scene when she is uh, shooting a scene and how she aborted the child. This, of course, is a, a suggestion that she willingly uh, did, did it. She, she willingly aborted the child uh, to get rid of the child so that she, it's not doesn't hamper her freedom, her career, but also perhaps to avenge herself against these men who have been uh, charging her uh, with obscenities, with uh, with um, uh, uh, abuses, right? Uh, they did everything they could for me. Shooting was stopped for eight days. They were all eaten up with anxiety for me, poor things. The, the director was almost on the, po on the point of tears. Poor thing. He's such a kid. It was during a camel race. He said he would never have included this shot had he known about me. Poor chap felt terribly guilty. He kept insisting it was entirely his fault. But honestly, even I didn't think it would happen. All that jogging up and down on the camel, so unnecessary. They could have used my double. But I was so excited. I'm playing the role of a Lamani girl. She's the second heroine. It's a character role. She's terribly fiery and terribly passionate, this Lamani girl, and terribly beautiful. They could have used my double, but I just didn't think. Why aren't you talking? Don't you believe me? And so they just don't believe her initially when she says that she was, she aborted the the child during a camel race. But uh, initially they have, they, later on they realize that they, uh, they have no choice but to believe her, that there is now no source of hope. Um, so Intuk says later, let's return to filth. The world we decided was not for us, could never have been. We were idiots out to turn dreams into reality. Let's go back to our old world now the world of filth as a punishment and as a sort of consolation too. Right? So it's, it's consoling to go back to a world of illusions. Right? What is this world of filth? A world where you create illusions in order to escape from uh, the, the fact, the fact of being utterly isolated in a, uh, in a world which has no meaning. Right? Pansy uh, wants to go with Garbo. Right? Initially, Gar uh, Pansy has this great sense of veneration towards Garbo whom he thinks of as his uh, as a mother figure, and he wants to she he wants to go with her. But then, when he realizes that she has aborted the child, he also turns against her and he begins to abuse her. Right? And uh, Shrimant is unwilling to actually let go of Pansy. And now we realize at this point in the second act that uh, Shrimant uh, possesses uh, a Pansy, with whom he also wants to have a sexual relationship. And so this also reveals. Uh, his, uh, his failed masculinity and the fact that he wants to uh, conceal the fact that he is probably a homosexual. So the, this comes out towards the end of the second act.
So when Pansy says that he wants to go and stay with Garbo, Sriman says, no, he cannot leave us now. Once he has been with us, part of our world, he just can't get up and go, leaving us high and dry. He cannot back out now. Pansy, you will just suffocate in that poverty-stricken place of your parents, walls blackened by smoke and a harassed mother, unpressed clothes and meager meals. That's all you'll get. You'd better stay here. Our life is more beautiful, much more beautiful. And Intuk says, don't use that word again, Srimanth. We're at war with it, with the, with the very concept it represents. Where is beauty? Is there any? It's just a figment of the imagination, a sort of mirage, a trap. I'm tired of struggling within it. We are free now. Filth, that is the only truth. We are free now to choose it. Let's choose it, make it our own and live with it. We are honest people. So now Intuk at this point we, uh, wishes to actually lead an authentic life, finally, by actually choosing to live with filth, choosing to live to acknowledge the fact that they uh, lead dis disillusioned lives in uh, an isolating city. Right? So, they, so I think the only uh, path, the only possibility of authenticity, authenticity perhaps here for these uh, men is to actually accept the fact that they are inauthentic, they, that they are imperfect, that they are uh, uh, failed men, and uh, that they are that there's no redemption, there's no way out of it. Right? In fact, Intuk also realizes that when he acknowledges the fact that he is not uh, an original poet or a writer, that he is, that a lot of his, uh, his writings, his, all, his, all his writings are in some sense derivative and uh, of, other, of other ideas, of other people's ideas. They're only plagiarized, they're only borrowed. Intuk says later on, uh, who are these invisible powers ranged against us? There's only one way to face them now, Gabo. Either we turn and fight those who wish to fight against us, or we gore ourselves bloody before they get a chance to inflict the first blow. We will choose the second way. You didn't believe what I said that day, but it is true. These powers desire to crush us and force us into filth. But before they can, let us throw ourselves headlong into it. Let us create our own world in filth. And then the very winds blowing over us will turn our enemies black and blue with their rotten, hate-filled breath. We cannot avoid these antagonists now. They are our eternal foes. We need to become very powerful. That is more rotten, more perverse, corroded with hatred. Right? So they need to embrace their own filth in order to actually show how perverse they can actually be. Right? It's almost like as though you're, you know, it's a perverse move to actually embrace one's own utter lack of authenticity, utter, utter lack of, you know, of, of being absolutely disillusioned with life and acknowledging the fact that you're disillusioned. And Srimanth now just wants to have kind of a, a mechanical uh, and rather uh, violent and aggressive uh, sexual relationship with uh, Pansy and with Garbo now that she cannot produce uh, children anymore or she's just, I mean, she's incapable of, of procreating that he wants to have a relationship with her, a relationship that, that would only reinforce the sterility of his life. In fact, his own sterility, the fact that he is a failed man. Right? He's a model of failed masculinity. And Pansy is, of course, uh, you know, cannot, uh, doesn't want to be bought by Sriman's wealth or by his power. So he really wants to actually leave him. And then he's the one who actually reveals the fact that Sriman is an impotent man. Srimanth also finally confesses that he is uh, a failure. He says, he tells uh, Garbo that, are you angry with me? But this is how it is. Why, why? Tell them if you like. Tell them, what's the point of hiding anything now? I stand naked before you. Tell them everything. I'm a flop in her bed these days. Do you know that? A flop, flop, utter flop. You know it now. Now let me have it. You, your scorn, your ridicule. You'll never understand it, Garbo, he says again. It's a terrible thing. You're the only one who's never laughed at me. Barbie laughed. Shireen actually spat. These are women that uh, Srimanth has been with. There was a time when I could tire these girls out night and night and still have more to give. He's also on drugs and injections, right? So which has actually completely uh, undermined uh, his uh, sexual uh, prowess. And so he, he no longer has the, this kind of sexual reputation that he had earlier. And the fact that now he realizes that for the longest time, uh, he, uh, you know, the only thing that actually mattered to him in life was money and the body. And uh, he wasn't interested in anything, anything else. He says, I was never fond of reading or art or studies or anything. Only things of the flesh. All I had was my body. That was the only truth, right? And there was no other alternative but to go on believing in it. And now it's my body that has let me down. I want that child. 
it would have borne my name. People would never have known about me then. Uh, so you know, he's the only. I mean, he's he realizes that uh, until then, that uh, the only thing that actually possessed any re any reality for him was the, was the body, and the flesh. And so uh, he thought that he could actually acquire an authentic self, sense of self through uh, through sex, uh, the sexual act, through the body, and by becoming a father. But then now he realizes that even they were uh, false constructions, uh, that there was no truth to them and that um, there's no way now that he can actually uh, redeem himself but to actually confess, to acknowledge even to himself that he has led a lie of a life. And so which is why Sriman then begins to beg Pansy saying that he, he's the only one who can actually give him back his body. Women are, are of no use to me now but he has nothing but contempt for me. Right? So he still thinks uh, he still holds on to the to the fantasy that the sexual act uh, is the only way that he can actually get a validation of himself. But then uh, not, neither is Pansy nor Gabo willing to uh, willing to uh, give him that sense of validation. So uh, Pansy says, like a spoiled child, I'll kill myself. Garbo, if he, if he hadn't referring to Srimant, if he hadn't come to the station unexpectedly like that, I'd really have committed suicide that day. I don't like my parents one bit. Out of all my brothers and sisters, I was the only, I was the one they disliked. I was the middle one, that's why. Well, not really disliked, but I just don't love them. I love only you, Garbo. Truly, do you think my running away upset them in any way? Do you think they bothered to make any inquiries about my whereabouts after I had gone? Not even an ad in the papers. I saw the railway line gleaming in the sun and I thought I'd like to kill myself. I have no one of my own. Srimant has been making a nuisance of himself and you, you are nice to me only when it pleases you. It was you who first said you'd take me to your flat, Garbo. Right? So he again is, uh, you know, very childlike, hoping that uh, Garbo will be uh, his only source of hope uh, and um, comfort. But he realizes that even Garbo has been using him for her own pleasure. Uh, so everyone seems to be corrupt or corrupted in by, by their own illusions. Uh, their own illusions of perfection, of uh, of self ownership, of security, and uh, that's what uh, they seem to realize towards the end of the play, when um, no one seems to belong to anyone, no one has any a claim, any claim on anybody. Uh, everyone seems to be equally uh, damaged and, uh, un and you know completely um, lost in their own world of uh, of uh, of uh, isolation and alienation and corruption. Even Garbo realizes that all he had. All that remains is the body, right? In fact, because since she also uses her own body to act and to actually, uh, you know, um, fulfill the the desires and pleasures of the men that she's with, uh, she realizes that even uh, Pansy has been uh, corrupted to the core. Uh, he he because he was an orphan. I mean, he left his parents behind at least. He abandoned them, and all that remained for him was the body. And that's the only thing that the only thing that these men had uh, to look forward to was was the child. And Garbo says, "There's no other chance of me conceiving again. She can't have another child after she lost the 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 baby." And uh, so now Intuk uh, embraces Garbo, saying that. Uh, she can now become uh, a part of their world, which is incapable of creating anything. Right? It's a sterile world. And this is also when uh, Intuk uh, confesses to Garbo that none of his poems are his, that they all seem to be uh, derivative uh, poems drawing from the ideas of others, that they completely lack any sort of uh, originality. And now since Garbo has also been uh, de-idealized, has been uh, dethroned from uh, the ideal, Intuk's ideals, that uh, she can no longer actually inspire him to produce something new. Garbo also seems rather uh, disillusioned. She says, I will not be happy with anybody now. It's too late for all that, too late for happiness, for love. That is never, never to be. The mind has grown too calculating. If ever I, fa I feel a momentary tenderness for anybody, the mind rears its head and hisses, are you in your senses? You are playing with fire. You know what suffering will follow. And what will you gain in, in return for all the suffering and the risk? Anything of value? And so on and on. Is there anything to be gained out of such exaggerated cautiousness? Making a million subtractions to get something. I can't cope with this anymore. I am a low woman of no importance. Why do you bur burden me with impossible significance? It is not fair. 
right? So, she realizes that she has become extremely deliberate and calculated in her movements. That she's completely lost any kind of spontaneity. Uh, she doesn't seem to feel anything called happiness or love. She, she's become uh, someone who constantly calculates and measures, you know, uh, human beings and uh, their gestures. So, uh, she doesn't seem to trust herself anymore, in fact. Intuk says that all his poems are all phony, that there's nothing original about them. And, and that's when Intuk decides to never write again. He says that that's the most honest and authentic decision he's made, is to never actually write again. That, in some sense, is that moment of authenticity when you confess, when you confess, when you acknowledge to yourself that there is nothing uh, original uh, in this world. There's nothing, there's nothing new to be produced. And Garbo says, I'd starve to death if I stopped uh, acting. Right? Uh, she says that uh, the only way for me to continue facing the cameras again and again with phony postures and gestures, that's the only way. She's, she can only survive if she continues to pretend before cameras. I sometimes feel I should have got married. I have no hopes left of ever doing a really challenging role. I've grown dry like bark of dead wood, waiting for a role or love to come my way. It is too late. Too, too late. Never again will I put forth tender green leaves. Do you remember the first time we met? We talked for hours. It was wonderful, but the wonder of it soon faded and all we were left was with was our bodies. There are times when I fell, feel a deep down restlessness. This is what my life has been. And now I'm growing old and I'm left with nothing. Inch by inch I have lost ground without gaining anything. Who will marry me now? When Intuk offers to get married to Garbo, Garbo says, Who will marry me now? Men will danced, who danced around me two years ago are now at the most willing to have me as a keep. So I think a lot of the play has to do with what it means to become more and more familiar with the world, familiar with the ways of people, uh, familiar with sexual desire, to the point of being absolutely jaded and bored of it. Right? So there's no, there's, no, there's no novelty and newness left. The more we live, the longer we live the more we get familiar and inured and accustomed to uh, the ways of life and then to the point that there's nothing new to be experienced, nothing new to be felt. And I think it's this deadening sense of, of sterility, of, of immobility and of the utter lack of life which, uh, which the play constantly seems to uh, focus on. And so Garbo says that, that there's no one who was now willing to marry her because she has become stale to the men around her. Right after more than two, uh, two, uh, two or three encounters, nobody seems to be interested in her. Uh, perhaps Pansy will marry me, is what she says. And then she even tells, she even quotes the director, the director who said that, who's just a kid, but he says that Garbo is now even less desirable than an ordinary starlet. Your Garbo is nothing but an illusion you have built for yourselves. That's what Garbo tells the three men that she's nothing but an illusion that the three men have built in order to actually, uh, you know, uh, survive themselves. The only way in which they can live is to actually think of Garbo as uh, an aesthetic ideal, an illusion uh, of uh, hope, of redemption, of, uh, uh, of life itself. Intuk says, if it's an illusion, we wish to keep it intact, else it would be difficult to live. Srimanth, why live? Intuk, because we don't have the guts to kill ourselves. What will happen to us when we give up our bodies? Would you be able to commit suicide? Right? So they're only left with the uh, their bodies, their bodies which seem to lack any kind of significance. That's the only thing which they have, it's just a brute body, a physical physical matter which seems to have uh, no significance whatsoever. Intuk, do me a favor, kill me, Sriman says. Pansy, you're already dead. Gabo, how cruel he's become. Intuk, and he will grow worse as youth advances. And then suddenly one day he'll realize with a, with a shock that he too has started slithering through mud. Nobody escapes ultimate disillusionment. Garbo, why do you need delusions? Don't you wish you could throw them off, all off and breathe freely? Intuk, I used to think that way myself, but that's not the way. We need these chains to hold us. We don't feel free with their falling off, just lonely. As our illusions fade one by one, our loneliness increases. So it's that sense of loneliness which I think the play constantly harps on that no, that, that no one, that everyone seems to have, uh, you know, this, this, uh, possess this fiction this fiction called identity. They identify themselves uh, through their ties with other people, right? But people find it absolutely impossible, almost impossible to stand alone, to be absolutely comfortable with their loneliness and to live 
uh, you know, according to their own uh, values, um, is it possible for a person, for an individual to be absolutely individuated? Or are individuals at some very fundamental level interrelated uh, to other individuals? Right? So it seems to be this constant uh, play between being uh, between individuals, between the interrelationships between individuals and the utter isolation and loneliness that every individual does feel in their life when they give up all the illusions, they give up all their ties, they give up all their uh, that, that very sense of identity uh, that uh, that marks their life. You know, so so is it possible to actually be beyond uh, identity, beyond uh, you know, uh, I mean, not reduce oneself and actually to be beyond uh, one's ties with other people? So we actually end up with the bodies. What Galbo says, there's no illusion there. Sriman says, "Kill me, kill me." Is this how life has always been in two castes? For thousands of years, people have been born and have been dying. Like worms, bodies beget bodies which wiggle and swarm for a while, turn rigid and die. I am sick, sick of the whole thing. Even art becomes an illusory thing. What art can worms create? Nothing genuine seems to grow out of me. If something does come up, it is stunted, diseased. Instead of growing, its leaves drop off. What can I write? It is not just leaves dropping, it is a root that is rotten. There was a time when I pranced about like a Moharam tiger, proclaiming, proclaiming myself to be an artist. It was a sad delusion. So, you know, you, you see that utter irredeemable sense of corruption that invades uh, their life like a disease, that they're unable to actually create something new and everything seems to be an absolute illusion. Even art itself, the very artistic production itself is, uh, is rife with corruption. It's, it's an illusory thing, which, only, which is only a signal of, uh, of their stunted growth is diseased. Uh, Intuk again later on goes on to say that, uh, that they're all fake, that they're all in some sense, they'll all end their lives on a note of self-deception. They've all deceived themselves. Uh, they're all, they've all deceived themselves into thinking that they can actually produce, they're capable of producing something great. But that seems to be an ever receding dream, which is never fulfilled. And then later on, Intuk says that if the body is the only truth, let's stick to it and make life beautiful. Right? So they think that the only thing, the only thing that's true, the only thing which is left when one gives up the chains of illusion, uh, of, uh, of, of greatness is the body, right? And so, uh, so, so therefore, again, the play seems to end on a note of sexual fulfillment, sexual happiness, right, through the body. But then uh, that, again, is not something which is going to give these men uh, what they want, right? It's not going to give them, it's not going to enable them to, uh, to transcend their limited selves, their illusions, and to actually acquire uh, a deep sense of union with the other. That sense of identity that comes with the sexual act is never promised, it never happens, right? And they only end up being as isolated as they were before. Uh, Intuk and now, Intuk, uh, Pansy and Sriman now think that perhaps Garbo is a part of their world because she is uh, barren, she has grown barren like them, right? So she's part of their world, but then Garbo does not want to be, belong to that world, right? She's not, uh, she doesn't, she wants to survive. Right? So she, which is why she actually wants to continue living, continue pretending before the camera, because she has to survive. So it's not like as though Garbo is free of her illusions either. But she does acknowledge the fact that she has to, that in the face of life and death, she has to uh, continue acting. Garbo says that I cannot be a uh, part of you. I wish you'd all kill me instead. And that's exactly what happens towards the end of the play. Sriman stabs uh, Garbo and she ends her life and she's murdered. But then uh, when they see uh, the blood is real, the blood is real, but Garbo was false. Right? So it's interesting that the, the physical body, the biological body, uh, possesses a life of its own. And uh, that, that is apparent when they stab her and she, she bleeds. But then uh, in the present, in, in the place of the, the real body, the biological body, Garbo has disappeared, right? The fiction called Garbo has disappeared. Garbo uh, reveals towards the end of the play that she insisted on doing the shooting, the sequence in the film on her, by herself, even though the director was willing to use a dummy for the race sequence. I wanted to punish him. He didn't come to my tent, Garbo says. I went to his one night when I wanted a role in his next film. He sniggered. He laughed at me. I couldn't bear it. He'd been like that from the beginning, taking every opportunity to insult me. And when I wanted to win him over, do you know what he said? He pointed at the camels and said, go to them, that's what you want. I didn't even have a second heroine's role. I was playing the aging elder sister. I had about three scenes to do. When I did the camel scene, my entire body was being churned up. And I kept praying, 
Let it happen, O oh God, let it happen. And it did. When I felt the warm blood streaming down, I screamed. Now let me see. Just let me see his, his miserable face. When I came to, there was nobody but a huge, coarse woman near me. I asked her whether, where the director was. She said, he's shooting. They found somebody to replace you. Right? And that's when she reveals that she has willingly uh, aborted the child. And so that's when these three men realize that they have, she has deceived them from the very beginning. And so Intuk says, Garbo, go away. You've cheated me. You are dead to me. And Garbo says, you deceived yourself. You should never have expected so much out of me. I'm an ordinary woman of flesh and blood. You burdened me with all sorts of imaginary virtues. I carried on for as long as I could, but I couldn't keep up the pretense forever. That doesn't mean I've done any, any wrong. And anyway, who are you to make demands on me? So this is Garbo's last uh, rejoinder when she tells them, reminds them that they are the ones who constructed her as a, they're the one who projected their fantasies onto Garbo. Right. She was an ordinary woman of flesh and blood. And that's when they all uh, kill her. Uh, Pansy calls her a whore and, uh, and Srimant uh, stabs her and uh, realizes that the, that the Garbo was false. In her place is the physical body of Garbo. So you, you, look, at the, you look at the way the play uh, constructs uh, a certain ideology of femininity. Uh, which constantly oscillates between the real and the representational, between the biological body and what the body stands for in terms of ownership, uh, in terms of self-ownership, self-validation uh, for the man. And uh, that's exactly how patriarchy as an ideology works in the play, where, which uh, basically uh, constructs a woman as someone who is uh, wedged between two extremes, one uh, two binaries of, of either being a, a promiscuous whore who can never give any, ma any single man a sense of self-validation uh, uh, because um, she, for her, for, for a woman like Garbo, men are uh, substitutable. So there's nothing unique or um, about about any relationship that she has with a man, and uh, on the other hand, she's also being projected as a as an aesthetic ideal, as a, as a as an infinite as an ideal of infinity, which uh, these men all aspire to uh, acquire, achieve, attain, and uh, towards the end. Uh, when Garbo reveals the fact that she willingly, she purposely um, aborted the child to punish the director, they all feel deceived. And that's how they li their lives end on that note of self-deception. Uh, when they stab her, they realize that that was just, they've only stabbed their own uh, illusions of her. Right? Uh, that, uh, you know, all the while long, they, were, they wanted to believe that she was their only hope, their only source of red redemption, their only source of, their only objective source of validation. But that, of course, ends on this note of uh, deception. So in the next uh, session, we will be discussing another play by Mahesh Al-Kanchwar, which is called The Old uh, Stone Mansion. Thank you. Mm -hmm.